Bonjour à tous. Je voudrais commencer ce matin en faisant le point sur le déploiement de membres des forces armées dans des CHSLD au Québec. Nos femmes et nos hommes en uniforme font un travail incroyable et ils sauvent des vies. Depuis la fin avril, la situation dans plusieurs CHSLD s'est stabilisée et de nombreux préposés sont en train de retourner au travail. Ça veut dire que les, forces, les membres des forces armées qui ont été déployés dans un CHSLD où les choses se sont améliorées peuvent maintenant aller donner un coup de main dans d'autres centres où la situation est plus critique. Ça nous a permis d'aider plus de 35 CHSLD jusqu'à maintenant et on continue de redéployer des membres des forces armées des CHSLD sous contrôle vers de nouveaux centres dans le besoin. Nous prolongeons donc la mission actuelle des forces armées au Québec jusqu'au 26 juin. Je veux être clair, les 1 400 membres des forces armées de l'opération Laser sont toujours au Québec et sont actuellement en train d'être redéployés dans des CHSLD qui en ont plus besoin. Nous poursuivons nos discussions avec Québec en vue d'élaborer un plan à moyen terme qui nous permettra d'appuyer les efforts jusqu'au 15 septembre. Ce plan inclut une participation active de la Croix-Rouge avec des gens payés, bien formés, qui seront aussi efficaces que les membres des forces armées. Le gouvernement fédéral va continuer d'être là pour les Québécois. Over the past few months, our government has been working with the provinces on providing care for seniors and the most vulnerable. This includes by deploying members of the Canadian Armed Forces to certain long-term care facilities. In Ontario and Quebec, we are extending this deployment to June 26th. Our women and men in uniform are doing a remarkable job Their help is still needed, so we're making sure that our elders continue to have this vital support. To restart the economy, to get Canadians back on their feet, we need a coordinated, countrywide plan. And at the heart of this approach must be how we do this safely. In country after country, state after state, a pattern is emerging. People make sacrifices needed to flatten the curve, But then, when governments decide to restart the economy, cases begin to rise again. And after months of hard work, people are finding themselves right back where they started. Canada must learn from these lessons. It's clear that we have to make safety and control of this virus a top priority in this restart. So that's exactly what we're doing. Our government is working with the provinces and territories to bring in the right measures to keep Canadians safe and healthy. Last week, I put forward our government's commitment, $14 billion towards a safe restart agreement for the things that Canadians will need in the six months ahead. At our First Minister's meeting yesterday, the Premiers, the Deputy Prime Minister and I continued our discussion on what this plan might look like. We talked about the measures needed, whether that's childcare and paid sick leave, contact tracing and testing, or PPE and support for the most vulnerable. And we talked about the fact that we must keep working together to support Canadians right across the country. Hier soir, les premiers ministres et moi avons aussi parlé des reportages et des vidéos qui circulent en ce moment et qui montrent la violence faite aux Canadiens noirs et au peuple autochtone. Pendant notre discussion, j'ai évoqué des changements qu'on devrait apporter aux forces policières, comme par exemple le port de caméras corporelles. Tous les ordres de gouvernement doivent travailler ensemble pour que les choses changent le plus rapidement possible. We have all now seen the shocking video of Chief Adams' arrest, and we must get to the bottom of this. Like many people, I have serious questions about what happened. The independent investigation must be transparent, and be carried out so that we get answers. At the same time, though, we also know that this is not an isolated incident. Far too many black Canadians and Indigenous people do not feel safe around police. It's unacceptable. And as governments, we have to change that. In my discussion with the Premiers yesterday evening, I brought this up. All leaders were united in condemning racism and in agreeing that we must do more to combat it. I raised with them some of the ways we can work together moving forward, including on practical things like the adoption of body cameras. 
This is something I've already discussed with RCMP Commissioner Lucky. But reforms are needed at all levels of policing, and these reforms need to happen quickly. In the days and weeks to come, our government will continue to move as fast as we can with all of our partners. Women and men who serve in our police forces must be part of the solution. They are people who've stepped up to serve their community, and they will be invaluable allies as we move forward to make sure that all Canadians are well served by these institutions. Today, I also want to speak about the progress we're making on travel and on our work to keep Canadians safe. Right now, physical distancing is still the best way to protect yourself and others. Of course, there are some places, like on flights, where it's not always possible to keep two metres apart. That's exactly why we've made it mandatory for travellers and staff to wear masks. We've also worked with airlines and airports on standards they should have in place, whether that's enhanced cleaning or putting distancing measures as people wait in line. And today, I can announce that we're taking another step forward. Our government is mandating temperature screening for air passengers through a phased approach. First for those travelling to Canada, then for those travelling from Canada, and finally for those travelling within Canada. A passenger who has a fever will not be permitted to board their flight. Employees in the secured areas of airports will also be required to have their temperature checked. There are strong measures already in place to keep people safe, and this screening will add yet another layer of protection. Notre gouvernement prend note des nouvelles pratiques exemplaires qui sont en vigueur ailleurs dans le monde pour protéger les gens. C'est donc pourquoi aujourd'hui j'annonce qu'on rendra la prise de température obligatoire pour les passagers aériens ainsi que pour le personnel et les employés. Je sais que le ministre Garneau en aura plus long à dire là-dessus plus tard aujourd'hui. Au cours des prochaines semaines et des prochains mois, on va continuer d'explorer d'autres façons de protéger les Canadiens et de limiter la propagation de ce virus. Right across the country, in every city and town, Canadians are stepping up to help. If you want a great example, look no further than the Filipino Canadian community. In Surrey, the community set up a blood donation drive as their way to pitch in. In Calgary, an organization called Fiesta Filipinos is raising money for care packages for families. In Montréal, La communauté philippine a mis sur pied un programme de popote roulante pour livrer de la nourriture aux personnes âgées qui vivent seules ou qui sont confinées. Aujourd'hui, en cette journée de l'indépendance des Philippines, on reconnaît toutes les contributions qu'ont apportées les Canadiens d'origine philippine à notre pays. C'est aussi l'occasion de dénoncer les obstacles auxquels cette communauté est encore confrontée. As we celebrate Filipino Heritage Month, we can't ignore the ways in which our country must do better. Too, member, too many members of this community face discrimination, something that has gotten worse because of this pandemic. There is no place in this country for racism against Asian Canadians or anybody else. Now, more than ever, we need to stand up against discrimination and injustice in all its forms as Canadians, we are always stronger together. Merci.